Welcome to Burrows and Burbs with hosts John Engel and Roberto Cabrera. Over the next hour, you're going to learn some insider knowledge that will help you overcome and strategize in the cutthroat world of real estate. Now, here are your hosts, John and Roberto. Welcome, everybody. Burrows and Burbs, number 129. Today, we're doing real estate staging with two experts, Lisa Hines from Stage to Show and Mike Lubin from Brown Harris Stevens in New York. But, but first, let me introduce my co-host. Hi, Roberto Cabrera. I'm just up the street from where Mike is uh, on the Upper West Side. All right. Excellent. And I've got my regular Meredith Bach here in Connecticut with me and Perry Drake. He's a regular. How's it going, Perry? And uh, with that, let's get going. So today, oh, you know what? I wanted to thank my my uh, my sponsor. So let's see. Let's share screen here and say... This is the name of our show, episode 129, Real Estate Staging. There's Mike. There's Lisa. I want to thank our sponsor, gracefarms.org. And you see their beautiful river building. Uh, they just completed a mid-century modern conference. And I believe that we're going to do the um, Design for Freedom conference is coming up next. So check out their calendar and support them by buying some tea uh if you get a chance now before i begin i'd like to pull up mike lubin you'll find him at bhsusa.com and that's his official page and with that stop share mike how's it going very well i'm so happy to be here again thanks for inviting me i was a little bit surprised to find you on a staging show i thought you were a real estate agent what do you know about staging <laughs> I'm happy to say I do a little bit of everything, and I'm one of the few brokers that I'm aware of who actually does his own staging. Uh, it's part of the services that I offer, and excited to talk about it today. Excellent. And also, I'd like to say hi to Lisa Hines. Wait. Hi. Hi. And hi, uh, you're from Stage to Show, and you're in Connecticut, right? I'm based in Connecticut, but I work in Connecticut, Westchester, the city, the Hamptons, all over. All over. How can you do that? You just have one location, one big warehouse and a whole lot of trucks or. Yes, we have a whole lot of trucks and vans and designers and a pretty big staff. And we have a 35,000 square foot warehouse in Stamford and we service all the surrounding communities and we stage near and far. How big a warehouse? It's 35,000 square feet. Goodness. And that's where? In Stanford. Stanford. Wow. That's, uh, I've got a that's thousand something. questions. Do you want to start, Roberto? Or should, <laughs> well, or well, I, I, I want to start by saying that my, I, I work with Mike, and he's one of my colleagues. He is works tirelessly, does it all, knows it all, and does it with like such care, mm -hmm. and he's gentle. So he is a very impressive individual. And I'm just so happy that he's here. So I feel the same way about you and you're no. a friend. It's wonderful. Yeah. When we can be friends with our colleagues. So, so the first question is, does it work? And I think as an agent, I come at the question of staging. Does staging work with a particular bias? Because as an agent, my job is to get the, get the listing sold. And so I tend to be not the client, but I, intend, I, I tend to be the influencer. I tell my client, I think that your house is a candidate for staging. And sometimes that's an awkward conversation, right, Lisa? Yes, I think sometimes it can be awkward. Um, I, you know, does it work? I, I have seen, we've been in business for over 20 years and I have seen time and a time again where, a house has been sitting on the market for six months and they're frustrated and they've worked with an agent who has not told them to paint or remove, you know, big heavy drapes. And, uh, you know, they have scratched floors and, and really kind of dated furniture. And we have gone in when they're frustrated and they're tired and they're about to get a new agent. And we've, painted and removed drapes and staged and it sells in a second. 
And uh, usually above asking, depending on the price, uh, of course. Um, but even new constructions these days, it used to be that builders never wanted to spend money, any money on staging at all. And we would do maybe one staging a month with a builder. And now the builders all want to stage because uh, I think there is a supply chain problem with furniture. And we have a lot of these young buyers that are coming in and they just end up buying the staging furniture as well. Um, so it's an added benefit that way too, because it entices the buyer to buy the house and sometimes buy the furniture and live on the furniture until they can get an interior designer in. So we've talked so far about two different kinds of customers. The first is the is where you fix a problem situation. I've already had the house out there. I've tried it with my clients, old drapes, old furniture, and it's not working. And so you come in and rescue a bad situation. The second kind of client is new development, those builders who want to hire you because they're in the business of moving product quickly. And for some reason, they've discovered that not using you gives them one result and using you gives them a different result and it's worth the investment. Yes, because they usually get more money for the house. And there's, I mean, there's a third client, a fourth client, and you could go on and on. There's all kinds, but there's also, I try to caution people when they're just starting out and the house hasn't been on the market, but it is very heavy, very traditional and maybe overly decorated. And I tell them, you don't want to call me in six months and say, we didn't do anything. We are just going to kind of put it out there and see what happens. And, and I don't, I want you to come out of the gate the right way because we're all on the same team. We want top dollar and we want it to sell quickly. And that's the reason that we're here. Mike, are you dealing with the same kinds of customers, the same solving the same two problems in New York? Are you fixing a bad situation or are you dealing primarily with builders, new development, uh, or em empty apartments that need some inspiration. So I'm involved in a spectrum of possibilities. One is I am fortunate to work on the new development side and model units are very, very important in new development. I'm not gonna speak about that at the moment. Um, I'm gonna focus more on the resale business because I think that's also, and Lisa, it's an honor to share this panel with you. Your work is beautiful. Oh, yours um, too. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to just give a little overview because, um, and I'm, I can only speak to the city uh, in terms of, you know, our practices, but whenever I take a listing, I would say there's a minimum of some paint touch-ups, some recalking, having windows washed, having a foyer painted, you know, where people are just knocking into things, sometimes a floor refinish. So to me, a, a home is really never ready to just go on the market. And I can't say that that's always the case with other colleagues, you know, and I find that our buyers notice the flaws sometimes more than the beautiful views or the wood burning fireplace. So I try to just create a clean space. And now we're almost in spring. I'm seeing some buds. Washed windows is like number one and doesn't happen so often. And anyone who's in the New York area, I do have someone who I love and they have insurance. <laughs> the next um, sort of step up from that is what I call like an edit and a refresh. So I try to work with what the owner has, but maybe we're gonna take some pictures off the wall. Maybe we're gonna get new bedding. Maybe we're going to paint a couple of rooms that are a little bit too bright or off color palette. Um, and we try to work with what's there. And it's also sensitive because as Lisa was saying, you know, this is someone's home and it's a gentle, delicate process. And it's often where they raise their children or where their spouse has passed. It's a very, staging is a very sensitive, delicate job. And also they don't want to spend money. What client who's, who wants to sell their home wants to, you know, spend a decent amount of money to, to prep it. They just want us to sell it. Can I just ask you to pause? Because I want to follow up on that question. Sensitive. You're the agent. Is it not uncomfortable for you to say to the client, I'm sorry, but your house stinks and I'm going to fix it. 
don't you want to point to somebody like Lisa and say, I, I want to bring in a professional, don't take my word for it, and make Lisa the bad guy? I love stagers and a lot of my colleagues use them. I do it personally because I love the creative process and I'd probably be an architect or designer if I weren't a broker. So for me, it's like a, it's a fun thing. Roberta knows this about me. It's a fun additional aspect to my life. I don't recommend brokers use my approach. They should be hiring professional stagers. Okay. okay. It, it's, it's just me. It, it's, it's very much a personal thing for me. And what I, my line is, and I'm sure Roberta says something similar, you know, our, our line is, we want to sell this apartment for the most amount of money in the shortest amount of time. And this is also like, you know, it is delicate. We don't hit them with this conversation all at once. You know, my first step is usually I'll bring in my paint touch up guy, and we'll say, you know, for a couple thousand dollars. And by the way, this is a seller cost. I do not pay that. And it's very important to say, you know what, a clean, fresh bathroom, caulk, you know, let's sometimes it's replacing an appliance. We have that conversation. Then it's an we have to ease into it, you know. And and at least I don't know if you know if you feel that's the case with your clients as well because it's maybe yeah. a bit, yeah, it could be intimidating. I I have a client right now who uh, I've I've told them we we need we need to do this, and she said absolutely not. All these agents come in and they tell me to just whitewash everything, and I'm not going to do it. And it's a four million dollar house. It's a beautiful beautiful house in New Canaan. And um, she has said, D don't ask. I'm not disrupting my life just to put it on the market. My stuff looks just fine. And I'm sure when she hired a professional decorator back in the day and spent a lot of money on these drapes and the silks and the, uh, I I'm sure, you know, it, it was, uh, it, it is beautiful but it is particular to her. Lisa, when I look at your images, I see a lot of white. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. so <clears throat> I'll talk about the white second, but I just wanted to kind of tag on what you said before with clients that say, no, don't even talk to me about it. I've already decided not to. I think that it's wise just to have them have a conversation with, a stager because I don't speak, I'm sure like Mike, we don't, we're not speaking from our egos. We're speaking from history and experience. And we can say, here's a house just like yours. Um, I mean, nobody's house is just like somebody's house. As we all know, they have they, it, their own house is their favorite house. And, but you can, I can speak from history from, you know, we did a house right across the street on, on your street. We did one around the corner. You know, I, I speak from experience in history and I'm, you know, like I'm sure Mike is because of what you were saying, you have to be very gentle with the client and compliment what they have done and appreciate that, you know, people have died there. There have been kids raised there and there's a lot of emotion involved and you have to be super careful with the way you talk to them. So I sometimes, I've had people who have said, absolutely not. And the brokers have said, will you just have a conversation with them? And I've gotten them to stage. Um, we had one in, in New Canaan, um, can't remember the street, but the woman said, I grew up here. I can't even look at this house after it's painted in stage. I won't even look at it. And she went in after we were done and she cried when she saw it and she wanted to buy some of the furniture in a good way, in a good way. She was <laughs> so happy and it sold right away. And, and it was, it was like a $5 million house. So, you know, that conversation comes with a balance though. Also, I, Mike came to, it was a park Avenue apartment that I had was supposed to get listing. The brokers had it for a year. Mike, Mike said, listen, I'll come along. I mean, let me just, you know, give you my opinion, whatever. I'll come over. And he was just talking to me and he met me, but he came in and he had an effusive, like almost an effusive sense, like this is an amazing apartment. Oh my God. And he went through a litany. He went through a laundry list of like, it's amazing for all this. Years. But we can make this so much better. This is what we have to do. And he, but he was like, get it all out of here. You know, mm -hmm. And it, it was, it was someone who was never going to come back to the apartment. 
Um, and he was like, we just have to redo everything. And then they ended up selling to the old broker because he brought some low ball offer and they're never going to go about it. But, but his approach was very much, and it was very, it was very clinical. It wasn't, there wasn't emotion when it came to just, this is what has to happen. It's like going to take your car. It's like, this is messed up. This is messed up. This is messed up. You can drive off the lot and it's going to break down, but we can just get it fixed and you're going to be good to go. Yeah. And it was, it was really, and he was just talking to me and I felt like a client when he came in. It was great. Beautiful. I recognize I don't have that eye that Lisa has, that you're saying Mike has, that when I walk in and they say, what should I do? I say, we need to declutter. We need to paint here. We need to paint there. But quote, you unquote, also say, let me ask my wife. <laughs> well, <laughs> I say, it looks fine. And then some other member of my team who gets it, who has a better eye for this, will say, it's being just fine is not good enough. We can elevate this to a whole nother level, you know, if we just bring in a professional. And that's why I've brought in Lisa. I'm going to pull up the screen and show uh, what you did to a house uh, I've got um, on the market. Let's see if I can find it. Um, let's see, Trinity Pass. Now this house was on the market for all of last year and didn't sell. And now you see what has what we've done to it. Um, I, I wish I could show the before and the after, but you can see now after a year of being empty of furniture, uh, we've painted the walls gray. We've hired Lisa to give uh, to do her magic. And this looks with, see, the, the spot, it's a white, a palette with a spot of green, and it allows you to see the architecture of the room. It's not just a big empty space. It actually looks like I could live here. I can imagine my family living here. I'm going to tell you that that kitchen, that, that cabinetry was overpowering when it was the only thing in the room. And now with a table and these chairs in this kitchen, it just feels a, a great deal more balanced. So Lisa, what else was went behind your thinking on a project like 507 Trinity Pass? By the way, this is a success story. After we staged it, we put it back on the market and bang, we have a bidding war between two people and it's going for full price. So this is a success story after failing all of last year. Yeah. And I would have painted the kitchen cabinets and changed light fixtures, but I guess we didn't have to do that if we have offers. But, you know, going back to your white question, John, uh, we do, you know, I think as stagers and Mike can probably attest to this as well. We often people say, oh, everything looks the same and there's no color and it's it's all white and uh you know those kinds of things but the point is it gets the house to sell and white offers a cohesion. why why is white sell houses it i i think you know we all know it's emotional and i think it appeals to a very broad audience and not everybody loves white but I think it offers a continuity. It offers a calmness. Um, it offers, as I said, a cohesiveness. And it just makes you feel like you're in a spa when you walk in. And I think there's something else too. The worst thing we ever hear about these listings, it's a dark apartment. It's a dark house. It's about light. Doesn't matter. You could be a modernist, you could be traditional. You people want light. They want if you know, it, and that's and I think especially online, people are buying an apartment or a house probably online in five seconds. They're gonna look at a picture, then they're gonna move on. If it looks light, doesn't matter if it's traditional or modern, they don't rule it out. Dark, you know, dark I Lisa, I agree a hundred percent. I would have spray lacquered those kitchen cabinets <laughs> and you replace lighting. I go to Home Depot for $150. They actually have phenomenal lighting because it's knockoffs of real things. And you can get simple thing lighting and spraying a kitchen cabinet suddenly literally renovates a kitchen for ten thousand dollars 
fifteen thousand dollars. All right, I'm going to pick a question to Lisa. Why is also clean? It's just clean. You know, there's a. It's fresh. I don't know, you, yeah. Remember the blue plate special? The plates were blue, so it was unappetizing <laughs> for people to eat too much. But I mean, Mike, white is just clean and and simple. Mike, this is question? an example. Hold on, Matt, Meredith. Mike, yep. this is these are examples of before. Yep. This looks white. This looks like I said in the good enough category. This looks That's light before. filled and white. What's wrong with this? Why did you feel the need to stage this apartment? Well, that, those are all the before photos. Yeah. Number number one, you or Berto and I, we're trying to get someone to see a house or an apartment as a home. And a home is not just a concept, it's an emotional experience. Can I see myself there? Can I bring my children there? Would my mother want to live with me there? It's Buying a home is an emotional experience. So we have to play to that aspect of the transaction. I don't think of it even as a business process. See, the wood paneling is now white. Yay. I kept the original wood beams because they're gorgeous. They're 150 years old, and that's real texture. And I do bring in color, I, and I use a light gray. I use white. I, I'll use, you know, like a light taupe. But I feel like one of my signatures is I, I don't shy away from color, but I'm also working in a different market. And I'm trying to create a little bit of personality, you know, and so I, I and I don't like to overwhelm with color. But, you know, I used a green sofa, but it's a big, open, bland loft that doesn't have 13 foot ceilings and crazy details. So I brought in some personality. Um, okay. Thank you. And I, I like these chairs, you know, like it's just. And part, Lisa, what I, one of the things I like about what you do is we want people, the best compliment for something for, from someone who sees our work is, oh, I didn't even realize it was staged. It looks like maybe, you know, I thought maybe this was someone's home. Yeah. That's our goal yeah. is to sell it, but to kind of fool people a little bit. Yeah. Looks, tell me about, plans, tell me about so breaking up the I space into multiple rooms, because it looks like you've got one big. You have four spaces. I broke up one space into four, four rooms in one mm -hmm. space. How? I have four distinct living spaces. I have a living room, dining room, like a little lounge, and then a home office area. The room is 50 something feet long. And that's something that designers do and homeowners do not do is you create multiple seating areas, multi-use. And that's actually a whole other area. You just walk right in, there's no foyer. So I put the bench. Mm, but I do want to just nice. reference that last photo is I use real plants. And I think there's something important about that. You bring in life. I, fake plants and fake fruit, often those are real tangerines. There are certain things that I do that I think spending a couple extra bucks makes a difference. I also like buying the tangerines and buying, buying plants. It adds a little personal something. And, and I think when someone sees a real plant or they smell fresh fruit, it also adds a little bit of a sensory experience. See, that's very white, but it was an empty nothing room. Now you have scale. Because part of what we do with staging is showing scale. The first thing people ask is, can I get a king size bed in here? It could be a 20 by 40 foot room. And they're asking, can I fit a king size bed? <laughs> you know, so staging is also about geometry. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think everybody wants to do staging and it, beco it becomes, it's about how much. How I much. That. I like that perspective, actually. I and, do like and, this as well. It takes an enormous that. room and breaks it into an office and then I guess a lounging area and a dining room and a living room. Yeah. It's great. And you saw the before, really the well before looked like nothing. You had the dark, you had the cheap wood paneling and you had a big empty room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I how think long did it take you to achieve that? Two days. It's great. Thank you. Wow. And I think it's important to give the, you know, especially everything is open concept these days and to give each space an end use, because if you don't spell it out for the potential buyer, they don't get it. They're yep. like, I don't know what this room is used for, What? how do you, how would you do that? And to Mike's point about the king bed, uh, yeah, that there, you, you need to put a king bed in a, in a primary bedroom if it can fit. Um, because if it can't, they'll say we can't fit a king bed in here. And we, we had a crazy house years ago, um, in Greenwich and it was on for 23 million, didn't sell, wasn't selling, wasn't selling. Well, who, you know, who can buy a $23 million, million dollar house, but the primary bedroom was so small and 
we put furniture in there, including a king bed and the house sold after that, mm -hmm. um, after staging. But yeah, it, it's, it's, it's scale, it's perspective, and it's an emotional situation when you're buying a house. I don't want to just hire you to fix a bad situation, Lisa. I want to get it right the first time. And when I talk to these clients, they're like, but my house is going to sell the first weekend at asking price. I don't need staging. My stuff is beautiful. Okay, but we don't have to do this on the first day. Something we say, uh, first of all, if someone's uncomfortable, I don't push them. We okay. are working for our client, okay? And we have to take our direction from them. And I never cross that line. But what we can do as brokers is say, same with the price. Let's try this for two to four weeks. Let's see what the reaction is. Let's see what people say. Let's see what the traffic is. Can we revisit it in four weeks, in three weeks, based on feedback? Because this loft that I'm staging, I've had on for a few months. It was a renter. I'm showing with renter furniture, which is a nightmare. Then it's empty. And now it's finally empty. And I'm staging it. It's a process. These things do not happen overnight. So don't push back. Listen to the client. And then hire Lisa two weeks in when everyone says it's a dark house. And meanwhile, it's not. Or they say they can't get the king bed in or they don't know where they're going to work from home. People have no imagination and no creativity, no vision. I would say that's true for 90% of the people who come in to see these properties. They cannot get it. If they don't like the wallpaper, they will not buy an apartment. It is literally that basic sometimes. Mike, how far into this listing are you? And has it has there been a price reduction on that prior to like up to this point? Once the renters only moved out a month ago, then it's been empty. I had it painted. I had the floors refinished. I had the caulking done. So all the things I would love to have done early, I'm now doing halfway into the listing. But that's OK. We're in the spring market. And when you have a renter in place, you can only do what yeah. you can do. Of course. Of course. So. It, so when it comes to stay, and I say, you know, like that apartment that we were, that, that you came to see with mine had all this flowered stuff. The carpets were flowered, the everything. And let's just say they had decided, look, we'll keep some stuff. You can do some stuff as opposed to wiping it all out. How do you, you know, how do you approach that? You, again, you just take it step by step. I'm always honest. And in that case, I remember saying it to you and you, we were on the same page. I said, because I think two of the rooms had a heavy decorative floral carpeting that you see in a hotel. People often say no because they're scared of the cost. They think I have to repaint, that's $100,000. New carpet, that's $50,000. Well, when you're Lisa or I, if you're doing this, you know how much things cost, you know how to get it done on the cheap. I have a carpet person that will recarpet a bedroom for $1,500, $2,000. Light gray pile, cheap carpeting. So when you start to explain, I know this sounds overwhelming or it sounds expensive. Let me run some numbers. When they see that it's not as intimidating as they fear, they get it. But it takes time and you have to ease them into it. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that you mentioned light fixtures before. I think that's, oh. something, you know, in some of these big houses where there's 56, 75 light fixtures in a house, they they get scared and they're like, oh, my gosh, how much is this going to cost? And I say, I send links from Wayfair, from Amazon, and Love. they look like circle lighting, but they're yes. but they're they're inexpensive. And um, and yes, we, we have our arsenal of people who will spray, you know, kitchen cabinets and bathroom cabinets that are brown and people that will redo floors, just sanding it down to where it looks like white oak and yep. just putting a water-based, you know, finish on top. Uh, so yeah, it, it's, it, it is, it's overwhelming. And I always say, don't, don't be overwhelmed. You'll get the proposal, everything's spelled out and let it digest for, for three or four days or as long as you need to, to think about it. And it's all a discussion. You don't have to do everything that I'm suggesting you know, the first floor and the primary bedroom are the most important. And um, beyond that, we can, you know, you can fix kids' rooms with white bedding and, you know, and, and decluttering. And hey, did you just give me permission to not stage the whole house, <laughs> just the first floor and the master bedroom? Yeah. So for sure, I think 
you know, you can get a sense when you're walking around with people. Like I, I get people that say, listen, I want top dollar and I want this to sell over asking and I want a bidding more and tell me absolutely a hundred percent of what you would do. And I want you to look at the outside. Yep. What do I have to do? Do I have to mulch? Do I need to get uh, new bushes? What, what should I do? And I know with that client how, how to write the proposal. They want everything. And so I will do every floor in the house. And and then you have other people there like I'm on a budget. And you know, sometimes I can get them to say, well, how how what is your budget? And then I just back into it. So first floor in the master usually can sell a house, but I always feel like it's eye candy to go from room to room. Like you have a, you have a primary bedroom, but then right next to it, you could do a little nursery. You could do a girl's room, a boy's room. You do a playroom. You could do a media space. There's all kinds of things that you can, you can keep doing. And yes, every little bit helps. And I think that, you know, you put 10, 15, 25 into a staging, you're going to get at least three times back sometimes yep. 10 times back. I mean, we had a house in Greenwich that went for over a million dollars over asking on Clappard Ridge. So <laughs> the numbers are crazy. I think there's also something to say to our clients, which is that the pandemic changed everything, but we are living in a completely different world in terms of media and marketing and our older clients and older, I'm including myself, anyone over 35, 40, we are living in a visual world where it's all about Instagram and TikTok and social media, where everyone is an influencer, everyone is showing a billion dollar yacht and house. So we are embedded in images of what Kim Kardashian and everyone else lives like. So people used to feel more open-minded and had a broader spectrum of what good design was, okay? So now people who have no design instinct or appetite or finances have this sophisticated palette because they're seeing the way very wealthy famous people live. So we can't get away with what we used to get away with before. The expectation is higher. And we can't ignore that. You know, it's like brokers saying, I'm going to be off social media. Well, that's great. I mean, if you have that clientele, you don't need to be. But most of us need to have a presence because the first thing our potential clients do is look us up, Google us, look at our listings, look at our image and our bio, or we'll never hear from them. So it's the same with a listing. It has to compare to what people are seeing online, in magazines. And that's something that our sellers, if you explain to them, they'll usually get it because it's logical and it's true. We're not making this up. It's reality. The other trick I have is ask them. So I'll have an opinion and I have, it's very sensitive. I'm about to list an apartment in a townhouse. It's a beautiful home. I sold it to the clients several years ago. Lovely couple and the wife passed. And the husband it has been devastated. This was his best friend. And I knew the wife and they were the most lovely, adorable couple. So now we're selling the home and it's, you can imagine how sad it is. And any change is very emotional because his wife decorated the house and I'm trying to bring light into it. And if I were to be directed, if I were to give him too strong of an opinion, it would, he, it would make him uncomfortable. So we're going through and I'm asking him questions. And I'm saying, do you feel that this heavy carpet is making this room feel darker? Because I think because it's on the first floor, we need to emphasize the light. And if we have sunlight, it's gonna bounce off the hardwood floor. If I'm telling him he's going to get defensive and he's going to get reactive, I'm saying because he's now looking for a home. So have it at least I use the word. It's a dialogue. If they feel like we're asking them, we're listening to them. It's more palatable. And brokers sometimes just speak without listening. Wow, that was great. Yeah. yeah. I, that's when I find resistance, I tend to find, I, I look up the other listings that they're going to be competing with and I show them the photographs of those. And typically the photographs are so curated, you know, even when it's the day of the photographer, you move everything out of the way and you put everything back. But it's like, this is what you're competing with. If someone's going to go see that and then they're going to come see yours, we're not going to, it's like going into it from a new car showroom and going to your car, you know, look at all the stuff that's in your car, you know, it's that's a big right. difference. And then the other, the other thing really is that um, explaining to them that, look, you're living in your, in your home. It's lovely, but we're in a different gear now. Now we need to sell your home. So this is a completely different approach. Now we have to look at this differently. And I explained to them, you know, for at least for myself, I've been doing this 25 years. I've 
walked with buyers into so many spaces and I know what enlightens them and what triggers them and what allows them to see the space. Like if I can't see the corner over there, that's a problem. And when, when apartments are empty, it's like, you know, it's interesting because you know, when you buy something, you go through that final walkthrough and everything's empty. And then all of the little imperfections show up and it's oh. always that lit, everybody goes to walk through and there's that moment where like, is this what I bought? Oh. Everybody, there's this level of depression. But <laughs> when you're selling a place, if you're giving them that right off the bat, it's just, uh, you have to, you have to stage it. Yeah. But let's get, I love, I love this line of questioning. I want to get deep now on the psychology of showing a house, showing a staged house and what it is, Lisa, what it is, Mike, that you're trying, what emotions are you trying to evoke? It's not enough to just say, I want it to be light filled and white is easy. I mean, I think that, um, I'll go first. I find that when people walk through a house for the first time, and maybe they only give it a, a few minutes, right? 15 minutes of their time, they get confused. Where have I been? How many, and I'll, I'll find that after they say, now, does this house have four bedrooms or five bedrooms? Because if all the bedrooms are empty, they all just run together on the second floor. So it occurs to me that staging, at the very least, would give each room its own personality. And when they walk through, they might think, oh, this could be my daughter's room. Oh, this could be my son's room. Oh, this could be my office. This could be my, but it, everything won't run together. So I find that the, one of the things I'm trying to do when I show a house is I talk out loud about what I'm seeing and I'm trying to allow them to, I'm trying to be a memory aid to what it is you're seeing and why it might be significant, you know? So what are you trying to achieve, Lisa, Mike, in the psychology of showing a house and how does staging support that? Well, I think everybody wants to live the dream, right? Whether it's your first house and it's 2,000 square feet or 1,500 square feet, or it's you know your fourth house and it's 15,000 square feet. I think everybody wants to live the dream. And that's what we're trying to create is something that's dreamy, something mm. that, as you said, John, has an end use. You know, what is this? Oh, this is where the kids study. This is where the kids play. This is where the gym is. And so we're trying to convey that dream that they, Mike said, that they see the Kardashians and how all these people live. And we're trying to also, I think we try like, like Mike to put a little personality into the rooms with some color or, you know, a little, uh, you know, sheep rocking horse in a, mm. in a nursery or something that gives a, a little, you know, twiggy on the wall in a wet bar or something mm. like that, that would give some personality and it's not, you know, and makes people smile and happy when they walk through because you know again the dark the dark issue uh you know brown floors brown table brown chairs i mean we see that every day all day long and then you know people walk away and the the homeowners and the brokers you know sometimes don't convey to the homeowner like why is this house not selling they say oh they're they're worried it has this it has that and they never say anything about the furniture but it is the furniture and I know it's the furniture. So I think, you know, bringing light in, making it dreamy, making it spa, like making it theirs that it's people can look at it and say, I need to live here. I have to have this house. I think even if the furniture is okay, it occurs to me that in some of these, maybe all that's needed is to remove half of it. I know that I've been in houses, I've, I've priced houses before where uh, I feel like I have to pull my elbows in tight to my side in order to navigate through the house because I might bump, because there's so much stuff around me and it doesn't allow me to actually see the house. I'm seeing their stuff. I'm seeing their collections everywhere and it's drawing my eye to all the things I'm not buying. So when is it that we're, so staging isn't always about adding furniture. Sometimes it's about eliminating. What's the psychology behind that? 
Well, do you want me to answer or do you want to answer, Mike? You jump in and I, I'd love to follow up after. So what we do is when, when somebody's living there and they're not moving, they haven't bought a house in Florida or North Carolina and they're 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 staying there. I try to use as much as I possibly can. Me too. First of all, it makes the client feel like their stuff is worth something mm -hmm. and that you like what they have. So even if it's an insignificant like little end table, I'll say, oh, that end table looks so nice. We'll use that and we'll use your coffee table. And you have a white sofa. It has kind of traditional arms, but it's fine. We'll put some pillows on it and, you know, a throw and it'll look fine. So I try to use a lot of their stuff and, you know, you can't have clutter. You can't have somebody said something about a corner. I think Roberto, um, you know, you can't, you can't have stuff in the corners. So I just say clear all, but the bed and the rug or whatever it is. And, you know, so we do a lot of homes where we use the people's furniture and we accessorize, or I, I will walk into a home that is perfectly gorgeous and doesn't need to be staged. I'm like, what, what am I doing here? You don't need me in here. And they're like, oh no, but it has to be perfect. And I'm like, it is perfect. And you don't need me here. Your house is great. Put it on next week, get photos. You're good. So um, there's, there, there are many different scenarios and, um, you know, so it's not just a clean white palette. I mean, you're showing houses where there, there was no furniture in before. So those all look great. Cause they're all, you know, they're staged, they're beautiful, they're dreamy. Um, but we work in many houses. Um, you know, I don't know if you knew that house in New Canaan West, um, John, it was a big $14 million house. We used half of their furniture and we used half of ours and it looked great. Yep. I remember that one. Here's it's one cool. you did on uh, Park Avenue in uh, Rye, New York. Yeah. Um, what, what, to give us a little bit on this case study. So, and then we'll come back to Mike. Okay. So this client, um, they were there, they were, were I, maybe in their fifties and their kids had all, um, moved out and they were moving to Savannah. And so they moved all their furniture out and we painted everything white and uh, we staged it. And it's the broker was Billy Prizio. I don't know if anybody has heard of her, but she is 92 years old. Mm. She's been in the business forever and she's amazing. And she sold this house for 300,000 over asking and had 11 offers in two days. <laughs> oh, wow. It looks beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. All right. So Mike, psychology of elimination. Yeah. Well, I just want to go back to one thing. And I love everything that Lisa is saying. I, I literally agree with every single thing. I like to be creative. So I sort of go in, at least I bet you do a version of this, is I like to tell a story. So I sort of make up in my mind who lives here or who's going to buy it. And then you create a narrative because it also makes our job more fun, but it creates a little bit of a story when the buyer comes in. I love using vintage books. Roberto, Roberto and I live right near to me, which is like the best green market, flea market in the city. I will buy artwork. You could buy, you know, real oil paintings, you know, for $20, a sailboat painting, probably in a Greenwich house. You know, these things look important. They look expensive. If you sprinkle them in, you know, with newer furniture or things that you use for staging, it creates a gravitas. And it also creates a story. You know, like I love what you said, Twiggy. You know, Twiggy's in a bathing suit and, you know, at the bar. These little emotional triggers are sometimes why someone buys an apartment. I'm selling an apartment in a in new development. And the stager did this. And I, I, it was so brilliant. They took a closet off a living room took the door off, painted a bright red, and it's a bar in a closet in, in a living room. <laughs> and this is going to sell this apartment. I said, it looks like a speakeasy. They put a curtain up. It's a lacquered red closet. It's not a wet bar, but I'm telling you, someone's going to buy it. There's like an absinthe poster in there and beautiful glassware. That's why you have to hire Elisa, because if you're a homeowner, you don't know how to do that. People think, oh, I need closets. That little bar, if someone entertained, you also, as a broker, you say, oh, that could also just be a closet again. We turned it into a bar. So it's not as if you did something irreversible. 
but it, it tells a narrative. And that's part of what this magic is. Can I, ask the hard, can I ask the hard question? How yeah. much do I need to spend? I mean, you know, I'm about to put my house on the market and I'm feeling, I don't know, cash strapped. I mean, I guess I fe I'll feel rich after I sell it, but I'm a little nervous that I'm going to put out some number, $10,000. Is it going to be $20,000? I have no idea because I've never shopped for staging before. I have no idea what it's going to cost and I have no idea uh, what the result's going to be. So, how should I, can you help the agents on this call, Mary, Joanne, myself, Roberto, can you help us understand, you know, the costs involved and how we can maybe walk our clients through this? Please. Yeah. So I think it depends on, there's so many factors involved and it depends on the price of the house. If it's an apartment and it's one bedroom, it's going to be one price. If it, if it's, you know, if it's a hundred million dollar house, it's going to be something else. And I think, you know, the bigger question I get is when floors need to be done, kitchen cabinets need to be painted, bathrooms need to be redone. And, and they are looking at putting close to a hundred thousand dollars into a house, but hopefully to get that back three times when it sells. So it depends. I mean, staging can be anywhere from usually starting at 10,000. And, but, you know, we're, we're, we're not always as crazy as we are right now. I mean, you know, July, August, I'll do staging for, you know, keep my people uh, in, in working and my trucks moving. I'll do something for less during, you know, a, a slower time. Um, but it, it, it depends. Right. So that's a key. That's key. All us agents who already think we know everything should <laughs> maybe take a pause. If I already think I already know what it costs to stage a house, maybe I don't because it depends on the season. And sometimes you've got extra, you want to keep your people busy and I might get, and my client might get a break. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, but most people aren't, you know, unless it's a new construction, John, where like they they thought they were going to have the house finished in April and here it is the end of July and they have to put it on and, you know, it's the dog days. Um, so it, I wouldn't say it really depends on the season. I would say that it's more the price of the house, but I will, you know, I will do things to like I said, during, you know, I, I wouldn't make that a public thing, even though I'm speaking to thousands of people, <laughs> but it, it is true. Um, and, and that's being honest, but I, I think, um, you know, I, I will do things like in December, December is not typically crazy busy. We're busy, but people say, I want to get this on in January, like first thing right after the holidays. And, they, they're not living in the home and they have to paint. And I say, I'll stage it in December and we'll start your four month clock in January when, when or February, whenever you list, because we're so crazy January through June with so many stagings that I would love to get it done a little earlier. So sometimes I'll give them a little discount if they let us get in earlier. And they also have a few months of staging free. Is there any so, uh, tricks to best bang for the buck? You keep talking about paint. I love paint as the cheapest okay. way to make the biggest splash. What else can you talk to me about? Bang for my buck. You did mention uh -huh. the first floor and the master, and it occurred to me that um, some of those are probably more important than others. Well, so I do keep talking about paint because I'm, I'm obsessed with paint because I think that if a room is, you know, Pepto-Bismol pink and they only have X amount of dollars, I will say stage one less room, but paint this room because it's not going to put money in my pocket, but it's, it's going to put money in their pocket and in yours as a broker. Um, and it's, it's going to help. And so <clears throat> the most bang for your buck, <clears throat> I would say is, you, I mean, first of all, curb appeal, it has to be clean. You can't show a house that needs to be power washed and is, is green, you know, on the outside <clears throat> and there's weeds everywhere. So that's first. 
And then the foyer. You walk in the entryway, you have to be wowed by a foyer. And then usually you're looking left to the dining room and right to the living room or, you know, depending on the house. But those are the most important rooms. First impression. And, you know, if that's all they can do, then that's all I would do. But I think I've seen deals fall apart over a kitchen and over a master bath. And so I always say, listen, I know you don't want to paint the kitchen cabinets, but please paint the kitchen cabinets because you're going to get it back. And, you know, we, we spray paint, we epoxy tubs that are pink. Um, you know, we, we had a house in Bedford that was on the market <clears throat> for like a year on Meeting House Road and it wouldn't sell and it was vacant. And I walked through and the broker said, we can't figure it out. It's like a great house. And it was, it was an amazing house, stone fireplaces, beautiful. But I walked into the primary bath and it was a his and her bath. And it was like huge. It was, but it was black and pink marble with black, like Poconos tubs. Um, and we went in, we epoxied the entire thing. The floors were pink and black. We The walls were pink and black. The show, we epoxied the whole bathroom and it became white. We staged it and it sold over the weekend. <laughs> I love it. Roberto, is it as important in the city as it is out here? Absolutely. 100%. I, mean, I, I, think, I think it's 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 really difficult to quantify to a seller what they're going to get back but the whole the whole process is about getting on the market and getting it done quickly because the moment you pass 3 weeks 4 weeks your price starts to erode so you want to come in and you want to get it done and the fast you're going to get it done faster by just being prepared it's the marketplace is a party and you want to be dressed for the party right you want to mm -hmm. come looking your best. You know, when you come in, when you come onto the market, you want everybody to go, wow, look at that. You know, that's what you want. Totally. I I, I'm a quick total tips. believer. And, and go ahead, Mike. I have a couple of quick cheap tips because you said sort of what's the minimum you can do. And this actually is stuff I pay for because it's not expensive and it's a big uh, bang for your buck. New bedding. Okay, a white duvet will make a bedroom. Look, I, Lisa, I love your word, dreamy. Dreamy is like the best adjective in the world. Let it feel dreamy, right? What's more luxurious than nice white bedding? Okay, it costs nothing. Order it online from wherever. Towels, and I don't let them use them. Get big, fluffy white towels. So you said spa-like, right? We want a bathroom to be spa-like, even if it's a little two by three foot bathroom, right? But if it's clean and it's white and they're beautiful, fluffy towels and a scrub brush, you know, a natural sponge, it suddenly looks expensive. Okay, clean, never underestimate how important clean is. People think they live cleanly, they don't. Okay, you have to get it deep clean and windows. The first thing people see buyers and when they see it, it's such a turn off. And if it's, the, if it's a particular buyer, they may not buy it because it, it feels that way. Um, oh, this is such a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> bathrooms that have a hundred bottles of shampoo right <laughs> in the shower and you know a hundred products because there's a teenage girl in the house whatever it is so i buy baskets and i say all the products are going in here this is molten brown this is mail it and gets this is what we're using you can't imagine how much these things work it's a signal that these are people who have money and taste and don't have 12 different kinds of head and shoulder shampoo <laughs> If you do nothing, right, towels, bedding, but hire Lisa, have these things done because buyers more than ever are particular and want to say no. We're going in with someone who has a no that we have to turn around. They're automatically at a no. This has been a great show. Thank you. Great. And that was a great ending. Yeah. If you love everything about real estate like Roberto and I do, please, Roberto, and I are asking, Burroughs and Burbs needs you to like, share, and review, subscribe to this podcast. We want to see you every Thursday, 3 o'clock. Send us your ideas for upcoming shows. Thank you, Mike. Thank, Thank you, Lisa. You, Mark. Thank you, Mike. Thank you.
Lisa, really you're appreciate fabulous. it. I want to work with you. Thank you. This has been a great <laughs> show. And uh, thank you. Do you have John. a final word, Roberto? No, just thank you so much for your time. Unbelievable. So, so great. Love it. Yep. Thanks so, so much. I think this is one of the most important things we do as agents is a positive first impression. Mike just gave us the tips for that positive first impression. And I do think that it makes the biggest poss biggest difference in uh, in the sales we're making. So thank you again for all your tips and secrets. Bye now. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.